have interpreters here today um, to potentially s interpret if someone needs it. Um, if you are going to use that, um, or if that would be helpful to you, please feel free to sit um, to the right side of the auditorium, um, right where you see the interpreters. On your right, they appear, um, and will as soon as they you know see someone who's who's there, um, they will begin interpreting. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Sam and Ajay. Um, they've brought some interesting specimens, um, absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so here you go. All right, so I think first we'll introduce ourselves very briefly. I'm Sam Golden. I'm an assistant professor in biological structure here at the University of Washington. Um, I have a, a lab here that focuses primarily on understanding the neural circuitry of social behavior. Uh, and more specifically, aggression, why some animals like to fight and find it reinforcing and why others find it to be equally aversive and how that can intersect with various neuropsychiatric disorders. But I moonlight as an anatomy professor, which I will hopefully share some of tonight. Hi, my name is Ajay Dhakar. I'm an associate professor in the Department of uh, Biological Structure and I as well have a research program and my lab focuses on temperature and pain sensations, and we want to understand how these sensations are felt and use this knowledge to uh, potentially create new therapeutics to, uh, to treat these conditions. All right, so we're going to get into it in a moment, but before we start, uh, I just had a request, which is that you please withhold any photography during the brain demonstration. Looking right at you. <laughs> uh, the reason, and there's a reason for this, is that these are donated through the World Body Program, which is a very active and very important program here at the University of Washington that provides medical samples uh, for uh, the medical school and for also uh, programs like these so that we can do educational and outreach events. Uh, but these are real samples from real donors. And so if anyone here has a family member or friend who has participated in this program, thank you very much. It is absolutely critical to the work that goes on here at UW. Um, but out of respect, please do uh, abstain from taking any photographs of the samples themselves. Uh, I think with that, we will get started. All right, is someone, can you hear, can you hear? All right, fantastic. All right, so we have some samples here. We're gonna go on a, a whirlwind tour of the central nervous system. We're gonna start uh, with looking at sort of the outside of a whole brain. So for those of you who have not seen a brain before, a real brain before, this, this is one of them. Uh, what we're going to do is we're gonna start on the outside, identify some large components of it, sort of talk about uh, a little bit how information moves around the brain. Uh, we're gonna talk about the spine and the spinal cord, and then we're gonna get a little bit more detailed and actually look at some dissected slices in either coronal or horizontal planes. So I think, we can begin. Uh, first, let's start with what's on the outside, the real outside. These are the meninges. They are a layer of very firm tissue uh, that protect the outside of the brain. Um, perhaps, I don't know, any interesting facts you want to share on the meninges? Maybe when we get to the spinal cord, we could do that. Mm, we could do that. Uh, okay, so these are on the outside. They, uh, if well, I the blunt supply, right? Yes. Comes in in the there's three layers, the dura layer, the arachnoid layer, and the chia. And the blood supply would be uh, I actually see that between the here. arachnoid and the dura layer, part of it. And, mm. and it's also where the cerebral spinal fluid uh, drains out. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Yeah. But to think about it as a protective layer. Right. So, uh, for example, if you've ever heard of a brain bleed, something of that nature, right? So um, I, I guess we should say that these, these tissue samples are preserved. They have been preserved in formaldehyde or formalin or some other type of preservative that makes the tissue quite firm. But the actual consistency of a real human brain is more akin to like a gummy bear. 
uh, it's quite sensitive to perturbation, which is why it's so easy to get a concussion or something of that nature if your brain is to rapidly accelerate or decelerate uh, against your skull. Uh, so we avoid that here by perfusing the tissue. So we've got two hemispheres. I, can't, I don't know what our orientation is relative to this, but we have two hemispheres, the left and the right hemisphere. Um, uh, the very front of the brain, uh, the frontal lobes right here. On the back, we have the occipital. On the sides, we have the temporal. On the top, we have the parietal. And these are just some fancy terms that we use to really uh, break down the gross morphology of the cortex. Uh, the cortex itself, like the neocortex that you might have heard of, let's see if we can get some images of this perhaps. There we go. Let me push this up. See if you can see this. Yeah, you can. Fantastic. Is the more gray looking area right along the outside. Whereas on the inside, you can see these sort of uh, whitish long tracks. And we call these two different parts of the cortex or of the brain a gray matter, which is the matter that actually contains the cell body of neurons, which are the basic unit of how we're uh, functioning. And the white component are the axons that actually transmit that information throughout the brain. And we can see a couple different types. So this is a really interesting cut right here. It's called a coronal cut because you can see it's held together, right? Right in the middle there. Can you see that? By a really thick white matter track. Uh, and it's called uh, uh, the corpus callosum. So some of you might have heard of split brain disorder. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, that's where one half, I, I shouldn't walk too far away from it here. That's where one half of the brain can no longer communicate with the other half, and it's usually because of a resection or slice right through these giant fiber bundles. You can see them here as well on the sagittal view, right here, that connect the left and right hemisphere. And when that happens, when those fibers actually get cut, uh, the communication between the, the two hemispheres stops uh, in humans. It's very interesting. In dolphins, they actually take advantage of the ability to put one half of their brain to sleep at a time. We can't do that, but, but they can. Okay, so the other really notable thing about the cortex here, speaking about uh, some evolutionary components, is that it has all of these grooves, right? I think you can see that really nicely on both of these. Um, and these grooves uh, um, are called gyri and sulci. And they have a really important evolutionary component. Let me see if you can see this right here as well. Um, so if you look at these other animal brains, and we're looking at a carp, and a frog, and a turtle, and a chicken, and a rabbit, the first thing you might notice, although it's hard to see, is that their brains are really smooth, right? They don't have all of these indentions. And that's because uh, they don't have as much surface area, essentially, in their cortex. And this is an evolutionary adaption in non-human primates and other higher mammals, uh, which we believe is predominantly one of the reasons we're capable of higher cognition as well. It gives you a lot more surface area, a lot more neurons uh, within this more evolved part of the brain that can contribute to these type of executive and cognitive functions. And we don't see them uh, in lower animals. Um, anything large you want to talk about? Oops. Right, sorry, just to reiterate that point, the, the reason also for these sulci and gyri is while our brains grew as we evolved in mammals and, and primates, our skulls, our heads did not grow also at the same time in equal proportion. So the order to fit all that extra gray matter in our skull, we, the, we had to have these sulci and invagination uh, to account for all this gray matter. Yeah. So let's move below that. Um, so we've got this cortical area that we just talked about, and then we have a subcortical area, which is even deeper. And inside the subcortical area are a lot of more conserved brain regions. Uh, as we go even deeper down, we get to the brain stem, and you can see that right here. So this part right here that is at the very bottom of the brain that's attached to the cerebellum is the brain stem. And it's made up of three different components, uh, the midbrain, uh, the uh, medulla and then the caudal medulla, which is the very bottom of it, and packed within that part of the brain are all of, or not all of, many of the nuclei that are so critical for basic survival. Um, since we're not going to get into the specifics of species. Yeah, but like breathing, right? <laughs> respiration, that's all taken care of in the brain stem. Yeah, and maybe you can make an image of this. Maybe a really 
really good example of one that we can talk about for a moment. Okay, so this is called a coronal slice. You can take a look at it. You can see it's just a thick section cut as if this is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain, so the anterior and the posterior. And it allows us to take a, a view, a frontal view of all of the stuff that's inside. Uh, and if you look really closely at the bottom right here, this is the very top of the brainstem called the uh, midbrain. And if you look super closely, you can see what looks to be like some uh, pigmented or more darker regions. Is that visible on the screen? Yeah? Great. Okay, so those are actually dopamine neurons. Uh, have, maybe we've all heard of dopamine. It's got a lot of very important functions. I think a lot of times we think of it as a neurotransmitter that's responsible for reward or hedonic processing, but it's also really, really critical in locomotor function. And so this part of the brain right here, the substantia nigra, that contains all of those dopamine neurons is the part of the brain that's especially susceptible to Parkinson's disease. And in fact, in a Parkinsonian brain, if we were to look at this exact same view uh, in someone who is exhibiting Park Parkinsonian symptoms, we would actually not be able to see this pigmented layer because it would have degenerated uh, by... that's very uh, important in learning and memory processes. Do you want to say anything about the hippocampus? Are you saying anything about the hippocampus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it turns out that the hippocampus is relatively small, but one of the reasons we know how important it is is through studies of patients who had either inadvertent or uh, accidental or even sometimes uh, purposeful lesions in their brain. And one of the most famous uh, is uh, a patient named HM. Uh, and he had uh, epilepsy uh, for many, many, many years, tried to have it, had it treated through more traditional means, but it was so intractable and so debilitating that his doctors actually decided they needed to go in and resect the portion of the brain that they, were, they thought was responsible for those epileptic seizures. And when they did that, um, it had the extremely unintentional consequence of removing his ability to consolidate long-term memory. He still could do all sorts of other memories. He had short-term memory, he had motor memory. If you asked him to tie his shoe, play the piano, not a problem. But if you asked if he had met you before and he hadn't met you before that lesion, he, every, every time would be the first time. Um, and that turns out that the hippocampus and some other brain regions, but predominantly the hippocampus, plays a really, really important role in, in that type of learning and memory. Um, So there's a number of areas we can point out here. Is, uh, one structure is the thalamus, right here and here. And that's, you can think of that as the relay station uh, of the brain. So information coming in from your extremities or your body uh, is gonna come up from the, through the spinal cord and then uh, pass through the thalamus before going to different areas uh, in the cortex. What else can we see here? We can also see uh, the corpus callosum in two places, too, with this picture, right? Up here at the bottom, and down here, uh, up here at the top, and down here at the bottom. And why is that? Because the corpus callosum uh, curves. Uh, it's like a handle. handle. It's like a handle. It curves around it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we can. Uh, yeah, so some other really interesting stuff here that you can see, though. Um, right here is the globus pallidus. Uh, the thalamus right on the side there. And again, these are very deep structures that are far below the cortical layers. And you can really appreciate that on this horizontal slice, right? See cortex, 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 the deeper layers. Um, and it turns out that uh, especially the thalamus uh, is this gateway that sends all of these projections to these cortical layers and acts essentially um, uh, you know, as the hub um, for uh, processing both motor information and sensory information. So it's a really, really critical one. And we can also, um, tapping on to the substantia niagara, those neurons from the DTA, right, they project up uh, to a structure called the striatum yeah. here, right? And it's there in the striatum that where we make decisions on whether to initiate a movement or not initiate a movement. So to these neurons, uh, here, connecting to these neurons. 
you can really see these white matter, tr white matter tracks that are, are allowing this type of connectivity. Yeah, so you can see again corpus callosum, which connects the left and the right hemisphere. In this coronal section, you can see the, uh, these projections that are going up and down. We call those projection bundles, and those are where all the axons go that actually exit uh, the brain and go to the rest of the body, which I think is a fantastic segue to talk about the spine for a minute. Sure. But should we talk about the ventricles? Oh, yeah, let's talk about the ventricles. Yeah. So we also have uh, ventricles in our brain, and these ventricles are filled with uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And they cushion the brain uh, to keep it in intact, right? And they keep it uh, filled, and they protect us uh, from damage. And they also uh, remove waste from the brain and, and provide nutrients come in from the field tank? Yeah, it's a really remarkable system, and I think we can all appreciate it. it you actually end up making about three to five milliliters of CSF at all times. You're just continually getting pumped out of this part in the ventricles called the uh, choroid plexus, and it just keeps getting made. And it's actually the pressure generated by the creation of this fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, from this part of the brain that pumps it all the way around the central nervous system, including down into the spine. And so, uh, for example, if you've ever heard of a spinal tap and someone's had to have CSS, uh, CSF collected, that's done along, oops, along this area here. Do you want to start at the bottom or do you want to start at the top? Well, I was going to hold it, uh, yeah, hold it up against your back. Oh, okay. Okay. The spinal cord is really quite short and very small, but all the sensory information and motor information that allows us to move our legs uh, passes through this structure. Unlike uh, in the brain where the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside, this is reversed in the spinal cord where white matter is on the outside and gray matter is on the inside. Uh, your spine has 31 segments uh, and each segment is, uh, has a spinal nerve attached to it. Maybe we can see it better on this side. And then we can see our spinal nerves. So there's a pair of spinal nerves for each spinal segment. Uh, uh, in the spinal nerve, the spinal nerve is, has two branches, a motor branch, which exits from the ventral spinal cord, and a dorsal branch that exits from the dorsal spinal cord. Along that dorsal branch is a structure called the dorsal root ganglion. And in that dorsal root ganglion are all your somatosensory uh, neurons. So you can think of the skin as your largest sensory organ, and so how do you sense pain, temperature, touch, is all through uh, uh, neurons that originate in these dorsal root ganglia. Um, so you can actually see really nicely on this one that there are two areas along the spinal cord that are, uh, maybe, yeah, you can see it, even by eye maybe, that are quite a bit thicker, that are enlarged compared to the rest. And we call that either the cervical or the lumbar enlargement. The cervical, being at the top, is the area where most of the somatosensory or motor output uh, for your arms, for your upper limbs, is located. And to house all of that machinery, the spine actually needs to be more bulbous right. around that area. Same thing in the lumbar section at the bottom. Uh, to cap to, uh, house all of the machinery for your lower body and your legs, there's also that enlargement. What's really right. interesting is as you go, yeah, exactly, as you go farther down, um, you reach the cauda equina. Right, because your spinal cord is, doesn't actually extend the length of your whole spine. It stops about L2, L2, L1, so about three quarters of the way yeah. uh, down. But the spinal nerves that are associated with each of your vertebrae uh, have to exit at the correct place. So what they do is they travel down in these uh, nerve uh, fibers or nerves. Uh, and we call it the cauda, cauda equina, and it was named that because it looks like a horse's tail, was, was, the, uh, was the idea. And it is in this area that one gets, uh, when you get, if, if anyone's had a spinal nerve block, that's uh, the, uh, it's, uh, you get injections in this area as well as epidurals that are given in that area. And of course the reason being that since there is no actual spine there, or well, spinal cord, if there were to be a mishap, you would not have lasting damage. Right. Uh, and so that makes it a very useful therapeutic uh, component of the spinal cord system. It's really remarkable though. You can really, so I'm gonna show this here. You can really see the individual nerves. Right. You know, the, the people often think of uh, axons and nerves as like these, they must be super, super small, right? 
Like they're all gotta be microscopic. That is not the case. And you can see them right here. There are also actually nerves that are reaching from the tip of your toe all the way up to your brain. So some of them are meters long. Uh, and it's fairly interesting to think about that uh, when most of us, when we think about cells and neurons as these super, super small things. And of course that's necessary to receive sensory and motor, sensory input or motor output across your whole body. Uh, and all of that has to pass through the spinal cord. Uh, is there anything else there? We said, we talked about the roots already, right? Yeah. We talked about the roots, we talked about the germ matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think we can do a few more parts, perhaps. And then, uh, I'm not sure what time it is. Are we, uh, it's, been, it's, been it's fantastic. So we can do a few more parts. So um, there are a few other really interesting brain parts that I think are worth pointing out. So one of them is we talked about how the cortex goes all the way around the end. It turns out there's one other very specific port of the cortex tucked on the inside called the insula. And the insula has some pretty interesting functions um, that you probably want to talk about. Right, well, you can think of insula as important for taste sensation, right? So your taste cortex is located in the insula, mm -hmm. as well as an important uh, place for integrating taste and smell, oh, smell. So if you think about food you eat, it really has a flavor, and the flavor is really the combination of that smell and uh, taste sense, the insula. is also very important for pain sensation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very important area in thinking about the effective component of pain, so the part of pain that makes you suffer, right? As opposed to uh, the sensory discriminative part of pain sensation, which is involved in telling you where uh, that sensation is originating in the body. Right? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the different roles of the brain and what their different functions are yeah. for us now? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, right, so we have... You can point, you can point them out here very nicely. We have our four lobes of the brain. We have our frontal lobe, uh, which is involved in executive function as well as motor function, so being able to move our arms. Uh, we have the parietal uh, lobe that is just after the frontal lobe, and this is where uh, sensory information comes in, so somatosensory information. Where are you feeling touch? Where are you feeling pain? Um, in the back, we have the occipital lobe, and this is involved in visual processing. And then finally, we have the temporal lobe, uh, which is involved in auditory uh, processing. Yeah, so I'll jump in for a second. Yeah. So all of those processes have different dedicated parts of the cortex. So for example, uh, we were talking about uh, the visual uh, cortex being in the occipital. Well, it's the same thing for the motor cortex, the same thing for the somatosensory cortex. And there are small areas that are called the primary cortex, like the primary motor or the primary visual. And these are the locations that are doing, are receiving the majority of the information of these different types of sensations. However, uh, all along them are these other areas called association cortex. And they exist for each of these major categories. And those are the parts of the cortex that are taking this information, this primary sensation information, uh, and doing more abstract things with it, right? Taking, for example, let's talk about like the motor cortex. You know, uh, if you wanna move your arm, Right? That's a pretty basic, that's a pretty basic process. Uh, but you also have to be able to initiate a movement. And it turns out that some parts of the accessory motor cortex are dedicated, uh, or what they're called set neurons, are dedicated to just the initiation of movements. Other ones, um, uh, really famous uh, and actually even controversial still, uh, part of the accessory co uh, motor cortex have things called mirror neurons. You might have heard of them, they got, they're very popular in the popular press, but these are neurons that fire only in response to you observing someone else making a specific motion, but don't fire themselves if they make a motion. So this is a really interesting uh, sort of explanation of how these different uh, accessory cortex areas can underlie more and more abstract forms of processing that their primary cortex areas uh, are not doing um, as much, I should say. And so that's, that's what makes up the majority of the cortex, various versions of this. Um, sorry, Sorry, sorry about that. Everyone. <laughs> everyone has a favorite brain part. We're, we're, neither, neither of us want to talk about the cerebellum, but we're going to. Okay, so the cerebellum. Uh, it's important in making our movements 
smooth, right? It's involved in unconscious proprioception. What's, what's proprioception? A proprioception is our ability to know where our limbs are in space. It's measuring muscle, uh, muscle contraction, right, and muscle stretch. So if you're an older professor, that maybe is what you were taught. <laughs> and it's still taught that way in the textbooks. It's, <laughs> and it's still accurate. But it turns out, we found out in the last 10 years or so, really 10, 15 years, that the cerebellum is also responsible for a lot of other functions that are not movement related that we did not really appreciate. Everything from cognition uh, to addiction vulnerability uh, to even uh, other forms of higher level cognition have now been implicated in the cerebellum. So it used to be taught, and I think it still is taught, I still yes. teach it, primarily as something that's responsible for coordinating complex motor movements, you know, making sure you can do things smoothly, touch your nose, things like that. Uh, but it turns out it does a lot more, uh, and that's a very active area of research now that I, I would say is extremely con controversial. I would uh, agree. Yeah. But I guess I'm, I'm more willing to accept it. Yeah, only, as am I. Uh, <laughs> but I was trying to keep it simple. <laughs> so that's the, that's the uh, we get a good example here. That's the cerebellum, which has these lateral lobes. Uh, what's really interesting, and we can see it here, is it's not really connected by much, right? So you can see how as I pull it open, it's, it's pretty loosely just sort of hanging off the back of the, of the uh, occipital lobe there. And it's really only connected via these midbrain uh, brainstem regions that you can see right here. This being the medulla, these two big bulbous ones that have this, uh, uh, an artery system wrapped around them is called the pons. And then on top of the pons that you can't see is that midbrain region where we showed you the substantia nigra. And so it is just hanging off there, doing its thing, although what that thing is is still up to debate right. in many ways. There's white matter axon tracks that connect the midbrain to uh, the cerebellum. Mm. And the cerebellum and that midbrain <laughs> together, they make up the walls of one of your ventricles, the fourth ventricle. Ah, we should talk about that ventricle and the third ventricle too. So we talked about the ventricles in the context that they have cerebral spinal fluid and the choroid plexus mm -hmm. for generating and pushing that cerebral spinal fluid around. Um, but the other interesting thing about the ventricles, like the, there's, there's four of them, although the counting is a little weird, and, there's two of them that are called the left or right lateral ventricle, and then there's the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle, just a naming convention. But it turns out that the third ventricle makes up the walls of a brain region that is super important to us, which I maybe can actually see here, called the hypothalamus. And I'm wondering if we can get it on one of the coronal slices. That would be really nice. Uh, so. We don't have a fantastic example of it, but the reason I wanted to talk about the hypothalamus is it's one of those brain regions that's responsible for a huge number of functions. Everything from feeding, to fighting, uh, sleeping, uh, thirst, uh, and it's an, it's an incredibly important one. But one of the interesting facts is since it's right adjacent, uh, since its walls uh, are made up of the third ventricle, right adjacent to that, it's in a, it's in a, a, a very uh, unique position within the brain to sample cerebral spinal fluid and other, uh, anything else that's in the cerebral spinal fluid that's in transit. Yeah, I think um, you can see the mammillary bodies that form mm -hmm. part of the hypothalamus. So there's two structures here, they're called yes. uh, the mammillary bodies, and I don't know how well you can, can see, see them. see it right there actually, there we go, perfect. Right, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that's the hypothalamus right there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then here is yeah, the hypothalamus uh, in this section. Here, it comes off the front of uh, the thalamus, the just immediate inferior and uh, Hence the name, hypo. Hypothalamus. Right? Yeah. Um, I think if I was going to talk about anything else around that, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So you can do the this. Yeah. We could do that. Right. Yeah, we have a few minutes, I believe. Uh, so we can open it up to any questions that are not medical or personal in nature, because that's off limits. But if you have questions on anatomy or maybe brain evolution or comparative anatomy, uh, happy to take a few. Or not. Yeah. Ah. I got a lot. 
and I'll share one that just happened. I, I shared this with a, with a class recently, and I'm gonna stick with this as an example. So I talked about mirror neurons being like this sort of controversial thing, relatively new. First discovered by an Italian group in the early 2000s, lots of work on them since then, um, but only within the context of the motor cortex. Well, it turns out uh, a month ago, <laughs> a paper came out identifying an area of the brain called the ventromedial hypothalamus. Ventromedial hypothalamus, as you might imagine, is right next to that hypothalamic region we were just talking about. Uh, but inside of the ventromedial hypothalamus, they identified mirror neurons that are responsible for only responding to the observation of witnessing aggressive acts. That's pretty interesting. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's a, it's a very interesting observation that's yet to be replicated. I mean, it, it's only been a month, right? So these things, science takes years. Um, but that's one that, I, uh, that just popped up that immediately comes to mind. Do you have a controversial brain thing? I don't, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so that, that's an example. I, I guess what I should say is that uh, what has happened in the last 10, 15 years is that the tools that have become available for us to interrogate brain anatomy and function have just exponentially increased. Uh, and so a lot of the classical anatomy that we have uh, a good firm awareness from is based on lesions, whether natural or artificial uh, in, animals. in animals, uh, but, but not at the cellular level. Right? And more recently, because of the advent and introduction of genetic tools that allow us to, in rodent or non-human primate models, investigate individual cell types or only cells that project you know, from here to there and only those, no other ones, we've now been able to really begin to attribute a lot more refined understanding. Um, but with that degree of uh, ability, there's a lot of contradictory results that we're now sifting through. And so it's, a, it's an exciting time, but a lot of new stuff is coming out that I, I think if you weren't in the field, you'd be surprised to, to hear that we're just still figuring out like basic things about the brain. We, most, we, know, we know less than we think. I would agree with <laughs> that. I would agree with that. Well, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. And uh, I'll, I guess I'll pitch Gray Matters Journal, which has uh, very consistently over the last several years set up uh, brain demonstration uh, at high schools and even at some middle schools. Uh, and if you're interested in bringing that to your school, please talk to the Gray Matters team and I, they can probably help you with that. Now, human brain, no. Sheep brain, yes. So, you know. But when you, you come to university, you can yeah. touch it. But in many years, you may have that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Over there. Is this uh, normal or is this usual coloration? This is, these are some of my first human brains. <clears throat> I'm used to sheep brains. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is not a normal coloration for a fresh human brain. These brains are fixed in preservatives uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, and that, uh, well, two things. Firstly, ignore the coloration of the screen because that's just all. That's not, that's not what we're seeing here. But if you look at the brain itself, um, a, a, a real uh, fresh human brain that's not perfused, that's been removed, is gonna be much more pinkish. It's gonna be much more uh, lightly colored uh, than what we're seeing here. This is an artifact of the perfusion uh, and pr uh, preservation process. And, and this is an artifact of the projector being 10 years old. So together, perhaps, it gives a bad artifact. Um, I think a couple more questions, one or two more. Yeah. Well, there, I think there are many avenues of research where people are trying to invest the, uh, investigate these th things. You know, sometimes if you cut some of these fibers in the skin, they will grow back. But the farther away they get from the source, it's harder and harder. But there's a lot of active research even here at the UW to seeing how we can uh, remake those connections or have those growths out to the periphery. 
As far as artificial connections, I think people are, are in fact working on uh, prostheses to do this, but they're also trying to bypass the whole circuit. Uh, so say you had damage to your spinal cord, it was ruptured, uh, perhaps you could take information uh, and put sensors in your skin and then bypass it up to the brain and just avoid that damaged area. Yeah, and and that's an that's a area of very active research where there have been a few successful publications. Uh, I think the most recent popular example of that is Neuralink, I think is the company by Elon Musk people that is working on that. Uh, but that has been variations on this approach of putting electrodes, large panels of electrodes, for example, in the motor cortex, uh, and then bypassing a damaged area uh, has been, been something that's been worked on in, since the early 2000s. And, and it, it, there are examples in humans of this restoring some level of function. Right. Ideally, if we could get the biology to correct itself, um, that would be the optimal yeah. way to go. And, and amphibians, for example, frogs, uh, have that ability. Uh, but we do not. Right. All the way in the back, and please yell. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the difference between like, asymmetric and like, vertical or something? Oh, uh, yeah, we could do some comparative anatomy. Uh, it'd be pretty similar, similar looking. Right. Smaller. Smaller, but pretty similar looking. It would have a, a similar uh, appearance of, uh, of uh, gyri and uh, uh, sulci in terms of the cortical folds. Uh, it, it would be quite a bit smaller. I don't know exactly how much smaller, but I would say fist size, maybe a little larger. Fist size. Fist size. Uh, but it would look pretty similar. Right. Yeah. If you look at evolution, the expansion of the brain, everything outside of uh, primates are on the same sort of linear scale, and then uh, primates are off that scale where you have much more density, with humans having the highest density. And then dolphins and whales having a remarkable oh. amount as well. Yeah. A remarkable amount. Yeah. Uh, there was another hand, yeah. So the question was on, is there a reason, an, an evolutionary reason uh, for the location of various brain parts? And that is a great question that I don't <laughs> think I can do justice to. Right. Nor can I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so mostly when we talk, I mean, there's so many quirks of the brain. I'm going to give you an example. When we talk about the motor system, right, we talk about the projections that are coming down from the cortex and going down to the spine. It would be so nice and simple if they just went straight on down their respective sides. That's not what happens. They actually end up going contralateral, and it ends up being that the uh, left hemisphere of your, of your somatosensory cortex is representing the right side of your body. And where those transitions happen, uh, and in which systems they happen, seems, when you're learning about it, incredibly arbitrary. Uh, and I don't have a good evolutionary reason for it, but it is annoying. Well, I think one of the reasons <laughs> would be uh, how, however they were sort of patterned originally, as we evolve, that pattern just keeps repeating itself, right? Because yeah, that's, that's the easiest thing to do. Luck. <laughs> yeah, it could be luck to begin with, but then that keeps getting reinforced uh, yeah. in different species. Uh, what we can say is this. There is a fantastic literature looking at the comparative anatomy of various levels of organisms. And there are certain parts that are far more conserved than others, especially in the deeper brain centers. Uh, and in those cases, for example, we can take advantage of that fact to study some pretty like, advanced behaviors in the zebrafish. Right? You would say, oh, well, the zebrafish brain has got to be way different than a human brain. And it is. But there are some areas that are evolutionarily conserved enough that we can use it as an appropriate proxy. Uh, and it gets a little better the higher up you go. So in, in, in flies, it's very limited. In uh, zebrafish, it's a little less limited. In, in mice, you start to get some actual traction. Uh, well, you have traction the whole way, but it's a little better traction. And then in rats, you can start really seeing some parts of the brain uh, more clearly that you would uh, be able to say are analogous to a human. Uh, and so these more evolutionally conserved components are something we can take advantage of. Uh, 
Uh, the question was, are there certain parts of the brain or of brains that are consistent across species? Well, across all vertebrates, I would say yes, right? So all vertebrates have a thalamus, right? the spinal cord, um, some kind of cor cortex, I guess, right? But minimal, would not, it wouldn't say, they don't all have a neocortex, which is this great expanse of gray matter that we see on the outside. But as uh, uh, all mammals have a neocortex, whereas amphibians do not, right? Um, but yeah, the other structures are mostly conserved uh, through all, all vertebrates. Or some, some homolog or analog, right. Right. close enough. All right, well, we only have a few minutes left, so we'll take one last question, and then we're going to start cleaning up if there is one last question. All right, well, if not, uh, unless I'm missing it. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yes. The question is, when did the nervous system evolve, and what did the earliest nervous system look like? Uh, in mammals, or just like in I general? I think in... In general? I think like jellyfish or yeah, the yeah. hydras, they have like a neural net, right? Yeah. So distributed neurons throughout the whole uh, body of these uh, creatures. And it was only, and then you think in flies, you have, um, what are they, neural bodies, are they called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, but if you get something that's like a brain, I think. I think that the, the argument I would make is that as soon as organisms became multicellular right. and having complex behavior, they needed a way to organize it. Right. Uh, and that's one of the first variations. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example of a nervous system in the human that is less evolved but exists that is still something we're just learning about, which is the enteric nervous system, uh, which is the idea that your gut has a separate set of neurons from the brain. And this is an area of research. I guess I could say it's controversial, but it, there's quite a literature on it. And that's another example of a type of nervous system within humans. That's different than the ones we, the one we primarily think of, right? The central nervous system. Uh, so my, my answer to you is uh, as soon as animals needed to coordinate complex behavior uh, along uh, multiple cells, they probably had some early version of what we would consider would meet the criteria of a nervous system, but I can't speak to the, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, so I can't speak to the exact time. Oh, okay. All right, do we have one more question? Yes, you have oh. time for one more. Okay, oh. one more. Right. We have time for one more. That's not on yeah. evolution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the, in the back, you know, your hand went up. I can't see back there. <laughs> Whoever stands up, whoever's most aggressive. That's a fantastic question, and I, I, it was hard for me to hear, but I believe it was um, what our personal, as, as researchers, what our personal thoughts are on the use of animal models uh, in research uh, to answer questions that can't be asked in humans, um, and what the future may hold in terms of those directions. Uh, that's a great question. So there are a lot of questions that we cannot work with in humans. Uh, a lot of the reasons for that, um, for the work, for example, that I do, comes down to the tools that are available for investigating neural circuits and cell types. Uh, my personal belief is that using animal models under the overview of ethics boards and with great consideration for their use allows us to make advances that otherwise we would not be able to do. Uh, that said, it's not something I, I think anyone really does lightly. It's, it's an incredible uh, challenge to design experiments that you feel are not a waste, that I feel are not a waste of uh, animal resources, and that will provide information that will significantly advance uh, the field. 
And uh, we put, a, I think everyone, for the most part, puts a great deal of thought uh, and work into, into making sure that happens. That said, there have been some remarkable advances in what's called in silico modeling, right? This idea that maybe we can model parts of the nervous system in artificial systems. Uh, and this is a really exciting area of research. That said, when it comes to looking at behavior and function, those tools are not even remotely where, uh, developed to a point where we can take advantage of them in the same way as an animal model. Um, so for me, personally, I can only speak for myself, I think the advances that are made possible uh, and the uh, impact that they have in, in both basic questions but also in therapeutic advances um, are worth the trade-off of making sure that we're doing it in the most ethically uh, appropriate way with all the appropriate oversight. Uh, but in the future, if we find alternatives, I don't think anyone would not use them. Uh, that would be a fantastic advance. Okay. Have you ever I completely that? concur. Yes, yes. It's a very good question. Yeah. All right, and with that, we are out of time. Uh, thank you. If you do have further questions, feel free to look us up and shoot us a note. Right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're going to transition over to the panel now. Um, so just around 10 minutes or so um, as the dissection gets taken down. Thanks for your patience.
started at the University of Washington with a mission of bringing neuroscience to the general public in an accessible, accurate manner. Each quarter, we produce a high-quality journal issue that's written, edited, illustrated, and designed entirely by undergraduates. Um, over the last year, we've also hosted over 30 outreach events, bringing neuroscience education to local high schools. Gray Matter's work is done entirely on a volunteer basis, and we depend on community support to carry out our day-to-day -day activities. Please consider contributing to our fun current fundraising campaign. We'd be extremely grateful for your support of our mission, and any amount helps. You can find the donation page at this QR code or at tiny.cc slash gmdonate. All right. Today we have five incredible panelists here to discuss neuroscience and answer your audience questions. We'd like to formally introduce you to our panel. First, we have Dr. Ananya Chaudhry. She is a research scientist at the Allen Institute. Um, second, we have Dr. Fred Rieke, professor of neuroscience at the University of Washington. Third, we have Dr. Oliver Rollins, assistant professor of American ethnic studies and neuroethicist. Fourth, we have Dr. Kevin Yu, a neurospine surgeon at the Falskar Institute in San Diego, California. And fifth, we have Dr. Bay Leslie Maswi, the chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Washington. We will turn it over to our panel. <laughs> And they will begin with a round of introductions. Um, Dr. Chaudhry, you can feel free to start and we'll go that way. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. So my name is Ananya and I don't think I have ever used Dr. Chaudhry in any kind of communication, introduction, anything. So I am Ananya and I just started uh, recently in Allen Institute of Brain Science. Um, like five months ago, so I still feel like I am in a university and I'm still a postdoctoral fellow and I love doing neuroscience from that mindset. So even if I am a scientist, I enjoy that aspect of learning and doing research and finding answers. Um, is that enough introduction for you? <laughs> yes, yes, then please. Hi, I'm, I'm Fred. Um, similarly, we can skip last names. Um, uh, I've been here for a lot of years. Um, I was trained as a physicist, kind of shifted over into biophysics in graduate school, and, and then really fully shifted as a postdoc, and then, and then moving here. Um, and I think we'll get more to kind of what inspired us and so on in neuroscience, but just um, very quickly, what I'm interested in is how do you build a nervous system? If I give you the components, how do you put them together to make a nervous system that works as kind of beautifully as, as ours do? Uh, good evening, I'm Oliver Rollins. Uh, so I am a sociologist by training, so very different from the rest of my colleagues on this panel. Uh, my work is actually interested in neuroethics and really the relationship between neuroscience and society. Um, more or less, much of my work focuses on how social inequalities um, are impacted by or affected by the production of neuroscience or how neuroscience addresses questions of social inequality, uh, social difference uh, within society. Uh, and again, I kind of work more or less kind of at that intersection between neuroscience and society. Everybody, I am not a neuroscientist, I'm a clinician, so I just kind of feel like I'm out of fish out of water. I don't ever see myself as a scientist, but I am in the field of, I guess, <coughs> neuroscience clinically. I am a general neurosurgeon. I um, practice in San Diego. I'm a private practice neurosurgeon, and I've been dragged into this by my daughter, who is a student here, <laughs> who has volunteered me to be here, but I'm very grateful and honored to be here, and hopefully I can <coughs> give you some um, understanding of neuroscience in the clinical setting, out really in the real world, where I have to be doing surgery in and around the brain and the nervous system and so on. All right, well, <coughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bay Leslie Mosby, as you heard. 
and also on a first name basis, everyone calls me Bay, B-A-Y. I'm the chair of the neurology department here. Try to cut me off. <laughs> I won't be stopped. So I'm the chair of the neurology department here. Um, and I am a endovascular and critical care neurologist by training. My current role is largely administrative because we have a large department to run. And I also co-direct something called the Neurosciences Institute here at the University of Washington with my friend and colleague, Rich Ellenbogen, who is the chair of neurosurgery. And it's a clinically focused neurology and neurosurgery collaboration with many, many associated departments and divisions that work in concert. And I think you see from the, the panel up here just how broad a landscape neuroscience covers, right? From the administrative to the clinical to the ethical uh, to the very basic aspects of our, of our nervous system. I also would comment that I was asked to moderate a little bit tonight. Someone up here had to ask the questions. I'm happy to ask them as opposed to answer them. And uh, I'm going to uh, start by actually asking our panel a question that is not, not as easy as your name, but almost. And uh, that question is, what you find most amazing about the nervous system? We've all been drawn here by the human nervous system. What do you think is the most amazing thing? And I'll start with you, Kevin. I'll share a mic. Yeah, we're supposed to initial these questions that we felt like we could answer, and that was not one of them. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but I'm going to try. And um, these are all really hard questions because um, they're, they're just so broad. Um, so let me sp speak about it from... Uh, a clinician's point of view, because um, um, I, I don't go in the lab and I don't do research projects, but I'm actually operating on people um, with uh, uh, disorders in the nervous system. <clears throat> so I guess the thing that really surprises me over and over again all the time in my clinical practice is <clears throat> how much elasticity the nervous system has, as well as how little reserve the nervous system has in two different settings. <clears throat> it is amazing, and this is just really the power of age and the, the plight of getting older, because if you treat and take care of surgically um, young people, especially kids, it's just amazing how uh, much injury or damage can be done to the nervous system and they just, they just come back. Kids do great. You, you think they come to the hospital after trauma, you think they're dead, and they just live. They just they survive. But then on the flip side, I also see lots of um, elderly patients who fall. Because we, we get older, we don't have the balance, we fall, we hit our head, and they, they come to my emergency room. And it is just amazing how little reserve you get as you get older and as you get sicker. And they can just... The closed head injury, or even if they had a small procedure and had general anesthesia, they'll, some, some of these patients will never, will not wake up for days. They'll eventually wake up, but they won't. It's just, it's, so those things amaze me how we are so plastic when we're young, and then as we get older, we lose so much of that. Um, so I, I tried. Did I do okay? Good answer. Yeah, yeah. Oliver, what, do you, what, what would your answer be to that? Um, so similarly, I did not initial this question, but... <laughs> I will provide an answer. Uh, so I think for me, one of the things, so as someone, as a sociologist who has been studying kind of the neurosciences, I think one of the things that amazes me all the time is the, is how much we know about the brain, but also how little we actually know. Like that both of those things are very true. Like as far as we have progressed, you know, particularly within, you know, the last, let's say 70, 75 years or so, there's so much that we also don't know, right? That, and, and so that, that as a sociologist and as an ethicist is very interesting about the kind of authority that we use through science and particularly neuroscience to make particular types of claims. But then it also has, particularly within the last few years, the way in which we've been thinking about kind of what, we, what I may call kind of that socialness of the brain, right? That it's not simply this, you know, three pounds of matter between our ears, but it's actually something very social about it, right? And that partly what we, you know, particularly for me was really interesting is that intersection, right, of, of the social. And then thinking about like really what types of, you know, from that, what we don't know, 
these new technologies that are coming out, like with, through the brain initiatives and others, um, what types of questions we may can ask in the future, right? Um, I mean, I'm also someone who's really cautious about some of these things being overly used, so at the same time, I'm really thinking through what are the best kind of questions to ask with the brain, right? Whether What questions that may go beyond what we need to ask, particularly types of social questions that I could talk about later related to my research, but also really interested in the types of new questions that we can ask, particularly about society, uh, through the lens of the brain. Brad? Right, so I think for me, the, the thing that really strikes me is how, how seamless our perception of the world is. And I think, I think it's just striking when you think of the complexity of what's happening in your sensory systems and what's happening in your brain, yet you walk around and rarely do you cross the street, look, not see a car that's coming. Rarely, you know, you, you're guided through the world in this just really smooth way, despite the complexity of everything that's happening to allow that to work. And it's so, it's so seamless that the cases in which it breaks, you know, visual illusions, auditory illusions, give us a lot of insight into how the system works. Um, but, but aside from those breaks, it's just amazing that, that all of the mechanisms are coordinated so tightly that you don't notice all of the complexity of what's happening and you, you're able to navigate your way through the world and really have a, a, a good representation of the world that you're working in and interact with that world in a, in a, in a way that benefits your survival. You know, I would, I would just comment on that before we get to Ananya that uh, one of the things I was so struck by when I learned about the brain was just to appreciate that every single thing that we experience is actually a neurological event. You know, if you think about it like that, the very core of the humanity of our species is the, the brain and the spinal cord. So every sensation, every memory, every emotion, Everything you feel, everything you see, everything you hear, it's all n neurology working. It's all n the nervous system working. And that's what really got me excited about it as an area. And then wh what's your answer to the most amazing thing about the nervous system? Um, I will build upon actually what Bay was saying is for me, the thing that astonishes me is how similar how not similar, how same our brains are. You have seen the dissection. Every brain, you cannot say that that person's brain or the other person's brain, brains look identical, but you behave differently. The way the combination, the communication and connections are happening, you make decisions that will be different from the, your, the next person, but they're the same cells, they're same neurons, and unless there is a disorder or disease, it's more or less have the same components, the same areas. Yet everything we do are so individual, so personal. And this is something that always fascinates me. When I look into a brain, I cannot say whose brain it is, I'm blind. But when I look at the subject, I know them, who they are, what they are going to do, and everything about them. So this is something that amazes me in neuroscience, like how same we are, how different we are. We are all are built in the same place. So that's mm, my answer. That's beautiful. Um, l l let me ask you, we're, we're, we're all here because we are uh, on the front of our science. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the innovations that you are dealing with or working on and how they impact the field? Maybe I'll start with you, Ananya. <laughs> so the things that I am working on, so some of the things you have actually already heard during the dissection, so I'm using that as the introduction. I work on dopamine neurons, and I try to understand how I can help um, in di disorders like Parkinson's and in future Huntington, but also my entire uh, career was built on dopamine neurons function in schizophrenia, in uh, memory consolidation, so both basic and disorder, but somehow I have no idea how I have managed to connect the thread through dopamine neurons from masters to now. Um, and the techniques that I am most interested in are in vivo techniques where you don't need to um, perfuse and dissect um, 
organism, but you can actually observe how the brain cells are firing and changing their calcium dynamics or even dopamine sensors, how they're varying while the organism is moving around, they're doing their business, they're freely moving um, animals. So for me, this is a amazing uh, technology and I am also building up on that to create more and more sensors that we can use in future to detect a freely moving in vivo system. Fred, do you have any, anything you want yeah, to add? Yeah, I think very, very similar to that. I think that um, the techniques for, from, for years, neuroscience was based on recording one neuron at a time and understanding what that one neuron did and then trying to somehow infer, you know, how the whole brain works based on that. And, and we've, we've moved well past that now with <clears throat> optical techniques and electrophysiology techniques that allow us to assay thousands or tens of thousands of neurons simultaneously and kind of associated with that. Um, analytical techniques, especially from machine learning, that allow us to then interpret those big data sets. But I think there's also a real challenge with that. Sometimes people draw an analogy, this is like, it's like an observatory, right? We, we can go, we just have to go make the measurement of all the neurons in the brain and then we'll understand what the brain does. But maybe that mouse is thinking about its next meal and we'll, we'll understand, you know, we'll see what all the, all the neurons in the brain are doing and the mouse isn't doing anything that we even know what it's thinking about or what it's trying to do. Um, and so I think it, the observatory analogy misses the point that we're interacting with the experiment. We have to choose the behavioral state that the animal is going to be in, the, the, the sensory stimuli that the animal is going to experience. And so it's not just going and doing that experiment, it's doing the right experiment that really gives us insight into how those circuits work. And I think that's a challenge that we haven't, we haven't fully, fully, um, certainly f not fully um, passed and, and it's going to be an ongoing challenge to really exploit those new techniques that have come online. Yeah. Uh, I'll give a, a, a good example of that actually. There's a lot of work that's done in, in uh, mice and rats that we translate into humans. But to the, the point that Fred's just making, mice and rats are nocturnal species and humans are diurnal species. And your brain state is very different at those two times in the course of the day, right? And what does that mean about the way your neurons are working, the way you respond to a therapy or an injury? So it's a very interesting uh, uh, aspect of, of the work we all do. Uh, Kevin, as a neurosurgeon, any, any innovations that you use or are particularly excited about coming down the, uh, the pipe here? So you guys know, um, is it... Uh, Star Trek, where um, they just wave a wand and can like tell what's wrong with you, and then wave the wand and you're fixed, right? <clears throat> so I would tell you that it it won't be long before we do that in surgery. Um, so in my line of work, <clears throat> during the time that I've been in practice, um, we've uh, um, it's been a really big push for what we call minimally invasive spine surgery or minimally invasive brain surgery, minimally invasive surgery, where our incisions are becoming smaller and smaller, and our approach to the pathology, the disease, the, the problem at hand is just done such more accuracy and in a more um, precise manner that surgery is becoming um, in a way like where we can do things without really, um, let's say, making a huge incision or putting the patient through a lot. I mean, even the things I'm doing today, I'm certain the next generation, at least two generations from now, but like, those guys were barbaric. What were they thinking, you know? So I think the fact that that's happening and we also in, in clinical medicine are also experiencing like you are seeing in your own world with your uh, new you know, iPhones and Tesla with full self-driving and so on where we use uh, robotic and navigation to help us with our surgeries where, again, it's really technology where we go in the operating room and we can place instrumentation, we can place objects in the brain and the spine in a very precise manner using um, computer generated computer technology and that's all it's, it's being done it's, it's something that I use on a daily basis in the operating room now even when I was in training it was very new and um, it just wasn't used much but even what I'm doing now is so crude and basic to what is possible and it seems like every day or every month every certainly every year the industry 
um, is keep pushing it further and further so that, again, I, I don't think, I think Star Trek is gonna be possible one day where we can really do things without even having to open the, we can do surgery without having to open the patient perhaps. So mm. those are things that are happening in my world, yeah. Exciting. Um, let, let, let me ask a little bit about the interdisciplinary space. Uh, you know, we're all from different disciplines here. We all work on issues of the brain. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about where you've enjoyed that space or where you've been most stimulated by that space? And I'll open it up to anyone who wants to go. Oliver, you grab the mic. Yeah, so my, okay, so as a sociologist who studies neuroscience, I mean, it's an interesting already kind of an interdisciplinary kind of space you have to stay in. Um, a lot of my work is ethnographic, so I'm like going to labs, um, working, observing PIs. Um, but I think more recently, there's been a lot more work, and it, it probably gets a little bit more into kind of our second discussion around equity, but there's been a lot more work around bringing folks like me who are either neuroethicists or study science and technology to kind of really team up with neuroscientists. So like, I mean, right now, I'm working with a team of a very interdisciplinary team, almost like this panel at UCSF, who have put in uh, for grants to really think about building a center of neuroscience that really combines, that really thinks about the relationship between neuroscience and society, right? So both at the stage of health, stage of research, and community. So like a big part of it, I think that's really interesting is these questions around, you know, what does it mean for neuroscientists to engage with the community, right? And in academia, we tend to use that term in a really interesting way, but like usually we're talking about specific types of communities, right, when we say the community. Um, but really to kind of think about how do you bring, I mean, so something like this, right, how do you bring the knowledge that's within the neuroscientists to, you know, this really complex kind of way of like understanding the brain, like what is important about the community to know, like what does the community need to know about that, right? And so in one way, I've been working with neuroscientists on that. The, another area has been with law. So as you know, it, many of these kind of discoveries that you guys are talking about are also moving into law very fast, which is a whole different institution, right, of thinking about what does it mean for us to use fMRI data within, the, within law, or what does this mean um, for particular types of um, cases around mental illness or all of these types of things, right? And so there's also been a lot of questions about like, you know, how should law interpret some of this? And the law has its own kind of metrics on how it interprets what should be there or what should be not. But having a group, I mean, the biggest part has been the interdisciplinary space, right? To really both push neuroscientists, neuroscientists push us in a way of kind of, not the, it's not the usual, I guess, ethicist kind of um, scientist space, or at least the way we've critiqued that as in saying, please come in and tell everyone that, you know, what we're doing is okay as the ethicist, but more or less, like, how do you build something from the bottom up that already has an ethic in it, that already is, like, really socially just or is already kind of addressing questions of society or of the community, right? And so that's where I've been seeing, particularly, too, I would say post, you know, 2020, post George Floyd, where the response from science has been really interesting around addressing these questions around inequality, both science and biomedicine, right? And I think there's been a greater push then to have inter inter interdisciplinary space that's beyond just the biomedical sciences, but also bringing in social scientists or ethicists as well uh, on these huge teams to kind of think through questions um, or advance particular types of questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting when you think about something like genetic therapy You've all heard about genetic therapy. The promise is immense. Uh, many of the most significant diseases have a genetic basis, certainly some of the most significant neurological diseases. But if you modify an individual's genes to cure their disease, remember, you're modifying the genes of all of their progeny for the rest of time too, right? And so there's some heavy questions that come with some of these, some of these opportunities too. And the minute you involve other disciplines, you know, like, like all of us, it's amazing how many layers you uncover that make your product and your outcomes so much stronger and so much more resilient. Any other interdisciplinary comments that you want to make? Fred, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, just, uh, and this might loop back to a couple things I've said previously and kind of tie them together, but, um, you know, I think this, the, 
the seamlessness of our perception is not something we can replicate in a lot of man-made sensors. You know, your, your, your visual system is capable of working under a much wider range of conditions than a, a camera can work under. And we don't understand the mechanisms that allow our visual system to do that. If we did, we'd build them into a camera. So there's a lot of interaction there between kind of engineered systems and, and the understanding that we can develop about how our own nervous system works and that could benefit those engineered systems in a number of ways. Maybe you want to build an autonomous robot that could go into a fire and, and its visual system would operate under those conditions in a way that would be similar to ours. We could gain some insights for the mechanisms that work in our visual system and allow it to operate under those conditions and maybe build those into engineered devices. There's a lot of back and forth in, in those fields. Any other takers on that question? No. Let me, let me ask a, a question about uh, as we advance into this 21st century here. So um, can you just talk a little bit for our audience about some of the major concepts about the nervous system that are being questioned or challenged uh, as we move into the 21st century? Any comments on that? I might start with you, uh, Kevin. <laughs> Sitting closest to me. I just, did I answer that one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. What was the question again? <laughs> so uh, as we go into the 21st century, concepts of the, about the nervous system that have been challenged, that have you know, struck you. Uh, you know, we've talked about how it's changing all the time, we're learning all the time. Sure, I, I'm going to piggyback off what you just said. Um, you know how you always hear that you know, something else comes around and that everyone's worried about, you know, their jobs are going to go away, right? With what ChatGPT and AI and the Hollywood writers are now striking because they won't have a job. Like, the computer's going to write their, you know, movies for them, right? Um, so I feel like my job as a neurosurgeon, as a clinician, because my job is to cut things out, right? I'm going to cut it out. But it may not, that may not happen anymore if we have this gene therapy developed to the degree that it's developing with like CRISPR and all these other things that some of you guys may be studying where really with just a flick of a switch of a, of a gene, you might be able to treat things. For instance, in my world, what I cut out are brain tumors, right? I'm a brain surgeon. So you come to me, you have a brain tumor and, and, and you know, it needs to be removed. Uh, my job is easy. I just crack open your hand and I just suck it out. That's, that's it. That's, that's what a neurosurgeon does. We get a lot of money for it, but that's about all we do, right? But really, I don't make much difference for you because the tumor at the cellular level just can't be removed with uh, even a microscope to the degree that it really is a complete and good resection for you so it doesn't come back, right? So with gene therapy, with the way it's going now where tumors are now not looked at just as this big mass on an MRI, but it's looked at at a, at a um, DNA level and a way to characterize them so that, because everybody, just like we're all here, we're, we're people in this room, but every one of us is different, right? Every tumor, I think, is different as well. So that's what we're learning. And so they're targeting the therapies to the tumor and its weaknesses. And so that perhaps one day, I don't need to take out your brain tumor that's with simple, I don't know, medication or you know, IV injection or whatever, target to the, gene therapy of the tumor that it will be something that could be controlled and treated very well, right? So to me, that's um, something that is really changing and happening that's changing my world. I don't think I'll ever go away in the sense that you're always going to need a surgeon to do something, but it really is, to me, fascinating and uh, it does threaten my job that I can no longer operate in your brain tumor, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a wonderful advancement that I think it's got a lot of promise. I hope I answered your question. No, I don't like that. Oliver? If I'm allowed to I'm pick it up. Yeah, go ahead. So I hadn't actually checked this uh, question, but you inspired me to add on to the things, mainly because um, I work in a gene therapy program and I feel like I should get uh, some additions to what uh, Kevin just proposed. So one of the things that uh, were being done with um, targeted gene therapy, especially like not in CRISPR level, which would be developmental, um, like at the embryo stage, but let's say in adult stage. 
So if you want to add, give them back uh, the dopamine enzyme that would help them produce more in substantia nigra, you can inject the protein through a viral vector directly in the substantia nigra and you can replenish it to some extent. But the point is that you cannot translate that into a human system. You cannot inject that in a human patient when they have developed Parkinson's symptoms. So one of the things that we are doing are developing IV injection techniques with the gen gene um, therapeutic vectors, which can be injected IV, and they have the codes that will take them through blood-brain barrier to not only the right area, but also the right cell types. So they will not be um, expressing in an off-target so that you might have more side effects. Let's say if somebody was taking L-DOPA, it goes everywhere. But this one would be taking the dopamine enzyme to the right cells in the right area. So this is something that we are kind of cur currently working on to kind of like to just add to what Kevin was saying that it needs much more targeted therapy, but yet dev delivered in a way that can be accessible and translatable to multiple um, levels of treatment. So this is something I found very interesting in my new job. Any other comments on that? I, I, I had something I wanted to add, which is um, this increasing idea of the state of brain health, that your brain is the product of all the things that have happened to it since you were an embryo uh, inside the uterus, right? And that we as a society have focused on disease and trying to fix things when problems happen. We have not, and this is true in medicine in general, not just in the neurosciences, we haven't focused as much in building resilience and preventing disease in the first place. And so when you think about brain health on that kind of spectrum or that kind of span, you know, everything that's, that's good for you from, from the time you're in utero until now becomes very important at a public health level. So things like the health of your, your, your pregnant mother um, at, a, at a societal level, at a social justice level. Uh, there's so many things that then impact the, the human brain and its, uh, its functioning. And that's an emerging and increasingly important concept in the neurosciences, which I think is really, really timely and important. All right, well, um, we, have, we have more questions here than we'll get through, and I appreciate the fact that these questions were, were submitted. Let me ask Oliver to comment on, um, or expand a little bit on something that he commented on earlier, which is the role of communication in science. It's a very interesting time in our society with communication. Give us some thoughts about that. Yeah, um, well, we were just kind of talking about like this. So I, I, I teach a large lecture um, here at UW in, uh, on race and, and ethnicity. And one of the questions that constantly has come up is like truth right like how do we understand truth in the world today which is absolutely then tied to these questions particularly these questions that i'm really interested in as a sociologist to thinking about the construction of knowledge itself right so like i mean what is a scientific fact right like these are questions that we're really interested in how do you produce facts like how do you know that this is a real fact right and questions with i guess some of my things that i think about with science and communication one it's just a question around, not simply, we've talked a lot about the possibilities of science, and I also think about what are the limits of science, right? What questions do we really want science to answer? Which ones are maybe, you know, what we may call trans-scientific, things that are not necessarily, that can continue to be asked by science, but we can't answer. So I can give you some examples. Um, I've, my research has focused mostly on how, um, really neuropsychology has thought about social behaviors and have used particularly like neuroimaging and other things to examine social behaviors. And so in one part, there's a question I raise around kind of the medicalization or biomedicalization of social behaviors in general, right? Because not all behaviors are medically, you know, or, or, or medical things that we need to study. But another question that comes up to me are, is just thinking about particularly like the communication is like, um, 
whether or not we should be studying some of these things in the first place. So my book that I've written is actually on neuroscientists who study antisocial behavior and violence, right? And I really question this idea that we can actually use fMRIs and, other, and things like that to really predict, right? Like to predict the next criminal, right? And so there I ask this question about the limits, right? But then it raises a different type of question about communi communication as well, and that is the question of what is the role of other neuroscientists? Because one of the things that I found that there's a lot of contestation within that field. Not every neuroscientist agreed on both the questions that were being raised or even why we were studying, let's say, violence, right? But then it raises a question of what is the responsibility of neuroscientists within society, right? So is it a responsibility of other neuroscientists to chime in to say what is problematic about this science, to really educate the public in a way of saying, you know, what is, and, and it's not the technologies, right? This is not a question of whether or not you can do an fMRI study in that way, right? The, the, that all looks the same. It's a question about kind of the ethics, right? What are the larger social implications of thinking that we can predict like the next criminal, right? Using this type of, so there's a, a responsibility that I think about of neuroscientists, right? Using a particular type of what we may call in, in um, sociology uh, a scientific capital, right? A particular type of authority that scientists have, right? To be able to really talk to, you know, to really deal with these kind of complex things, but also to kind of convince the public or speak to the public what is not necessarily true about these types of scientific facts that are being presented, or at least complicate that issue a little bit more, right? Because I think. One of the things we like the neuroscience of violence, one of the things about the biology of violence is I think most people, even if we don't admit it, when we see a violent act, we think that there must be something innately wrong with this person, right? And we don't necessarily, not to, not to say that the brain is not at work, because obviously the brain is doing something, but is it simply a brain-based kind of behavior that we're talking about? And then what does that mean for us to, to, to have a better educated public about these types of things, right? Does that mean that we make better choices? Does that mean we can produce better science? Do we fund better science, right? Like all of these types of questions, I think, flow from like that communication between science and society in that way. Uh, I have to say, I, I firmly believe, and I say this to our faculty a lot, that every problem in the world at some level is a communication problem, whether it's a problem between nations or a problem in your home at the dinner table, there's a communication breakdown, right? And I challenge anyone here to find a problem for which that isn't true. And so we, we in the world of science are really uh, challenged by the fact that science is being called into question. And I personally think that science is the bedrock of our progress as, as, a, as a species. And it has to be protected. And so the, these questions are very, very important. Um, anyone else want to make any comments on the communication piece? Not especially. All right, no takers. Um, all of us said it too well, right. Um, le let me ask a little bit about, about some of the challenges that you face in the neuroscience space in your, in your clinical work or in your research work um, as you've, you've gotten to where you are now. And I'll start with you, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to find a question he actually likes. So I haven't found one yet. Are there any easy questions from this list? Um, challenges, I, I think. Um, as a clinician, the challenge is the um, uh, is the financial situation of our health system. And mm -hmm. if you guys, none of you guys know this, you're not you're not on Medicare, but you do realize that that the government funding of our health system is in is in terrible crisis, right? So that they're they're predicted to run out of money before you graduate from University of Washington, right? So where do we go from here? Because um, healthcare is very costly. Innovation is very costly. Science is extremely costly. Um, and yet we keep marching forward because we want more, right? We want to be healthier. We want to live longer. We want to have better, you know, healthier children, progeny, whatever it might be. So to me, the, the greatest crisis is, um, is, is how do we fund our healthcare system? Because uh, I will tell you, as a clinician, uh, and I don't, I don't go hungry, not for sure, but every year the government is, keeps, you know, decreasing our reimbursement, decreasing what we get paid, and whether we like it or not, the rest of the, the, the health industry goes along with whatever the government pays. So it's really interesting that at the end of the day, I'm really a government employee, so uh, indirectly. So that to me is a, is a big crisis clinically, 
But I don't doubt that you guys are feeling as well in your scientific world where the funding is also a problem, right? It's probably not as good, it's getting tougher, right? So uh, the, the world is, is, has got some really big financial problems now. Like some of you guys might be aware that I don't know how that's going to allow us as scientists to do your research and us as clinicians to carry out the care clinically from your research efforts. Mm. Ananya, any, any comments on that from a challenge? Yeah, I, I think just to echo the funding issues that, uh, you know, I think, I think the way grant funding is right now, it's pretty clear that the, the pay lines, you know, the division between grants that are funded and not funded is, is quite arbitrary. That there are lots of grants that are not funded that, that if there was more money, the review panels would, would completely agree should be funded. And I think that was much less true 20 years ago, where those pay lines were being put at a point that was a little bit more of a real scientific division between strong and not as strong grants. And, and I think that's, that's a problem just because you end up making arbitrary distinctions between those labs that are gonna get funding and those that are not. And, and, and that those distinctions are, are an opportunity for all kinds of other factors to come in that we probably don't want coming into those review processes. So, biases can come in, there's lots of things that can come in that are not kind of a straight scientific evaluation of the strength of the project. And I think, I think that's a real challenge that we face going forward. Anana? Yeah, since the major problem funding has been covered twice now, uh, one of the things that I have to say that maybe it's true for a lot of um, international uh, researchers. So I have, I was born in India and I did my bachelor's from India. Then I did my master's from Germany and PhD from Switzerland, postdoc from UCLA, and now I'm here. So <laughs> I have traveled, I have chased neuroscience through three continents, four countries so far. And I can say that one of the major problem was visa and immigration policies and they, most of the time you get the help from the university. It's getting more and more harder now with um, pandemics and backlogs and sheer number of applications. And it's not only for US that I'm speaking. I have experience in other countries, other continents, and it's a general um, movement a uh, problem, especially for international researchers. For me, science is everybody's. I don't belong to a country. I don't belong to one particular um, group of people. So this is something that I will keep fighting for to prove. Next time I will go to Australia. I don't even know what I want to do in Australia, but just to prove my point that I can work everywhere. I can communicate my science to everybody in every part. Actually, not Japan. So next time it's Japan. Uh, but this is what I think that I wish there was a way to facilitate scientific movement um, a little more than other jobs. Like there are different categories that can be done. But again, I understand why it has to happen this way. and. I totally understand why geographically and bureaucratically and government-wise they have to make those restrictions. But, you know, at that moment when you are waiting six months for your visa to be approved and you might lose your position in the PhD program, sometimes difficult to remember those uh, logic. Mm. Yeah, there, there's no geography on talent, right? There's no geography of motivation. Um, but it's definitely a geography of opportunity. I, I, I think we hear the, the, the funding theme coming through very, very strongly here. And uh, I would say that we're in a department chair hat. That is actually our biggest challenge. We have clinical care to deliver, just like all the, uh, the um, private practice environments, hospitals and practices across the country. But we also have an education mission and we have a research mission that has to be funded from a, a similar or often smaller clinical revenue base. And so those extra funding sources, either from government funding for grants 
from philanthropy. You saw the, uh, the QR code on the, on the screen behind us at the beginning, right? Those, those extra sources of revenue become so important in achieving that larger institutional mission and they're under immense threat at the moment. Yeah. All right, well, um, let me get to our last question before we break. And uh, like the first question, it's, a, I think, a, a nice and easy one. And the question is, uh, I think Kevin will agree with this. The question is, um, how has neuroscience changed the way that you look at or approach the world? And I, I'll, I'll kick us off before you have to answer, Kevin, all right? Um, and I'll, I'll say that for me, what is, what is done has given me an immense gratitude for the health that I have, the health that my loved ones have, and the opportunities that I have to interface with the world. Um, seeing it in the state of disease, which is often how I see neurological um, uh, patients, just makes you feel so fortunate and so eager to protect it and to find answers for these problems. Kevin. Still a very hard question. Um, so how has neuroscience changed my view of the world? Or, um, I don't know if it's really changed, the, changed my view of the world. It's just that um, I was, I, when I graduated from medical school, I followed a, a mentor and he was a neurosurgeon. I'm like, that's what I want to do. And, and here I am. So it's sort of something that I've always wanted to do. Um, I, I think it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's like, like we all do, <laughs> you said it earlier that for me, the brain and the spine are the only organs that are in the human body, right? Nothing else matters. So in that sense, it's, it's something that has made, allowed me to, uh, develop a trade. That's what I do. It's my living. It's my job. It's, it's, what, it's my career. Um, and it allowed me to really, uh, just um, had a fulfilling um, career in, in, in the sense that I'm able to care of something that is uh, incredibly complex, incredibly valuable, and incredibly interesting, um, uh, and challenging, and hard, and sometimes downright just makes you humble, you know, so it's, it's a life that's been fulfilling, I guess, in that way, so yes, I appreciate the fact that I've had the opportunity to have st studied uh, neurosurgery to have practiced neurosurgery and care for patients that I could operate on and take care of. So yes, in that way, it's been fulfilling. Oliver, what about you? So let's see, it's kind of this is kind of a hard question. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's been a little different because my path has been so different. So I was a biology undergrad. Um, I have a master's in Pan African studies. I have a PhD in medical sociology, and now I'm studying neuroethics, right? So I've kind of just have weaved all these things together in ways that um, really made me, you know, really further my education. I mean, I really had to, like, really start to, like, take neuroscience classes and stuff as I was doing my PhD to kind of get through. But, like, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned in this path is this kind of relationship between kind of knowledge and society, and particularly this kind of question around politics, right? I mean, that was, I was thinking about this question when this last thing came up and around that relationship between science and politics, right? And it, traditionally, there's been these boundaries between kind of like what you do in the lab, what you do in the clinic, and what is supposedly happening on the outside. And one of the things that I think more recently neuroscience has done, particularly, is kind of make, really collapse that, right? To say we're asking these kind of social type questions, not simply just medical based questions, right? But it also raises kind of these interesting questions that I think was coming out in that last comment around, is there, is this a moment in which we need to be a little bit more political in the sense? Like what is the role of neuroscientists or even academics in the sense of these larger kind of funding crises that we're talking about? Like, I mean, oftentimes we kind of just let these things happen and like that's politics and that's out the door, but there is a role I think that we should be kind of playing in the sense of shaping the general kind of conversation too around the need for more funding. I mean, I, I've sat on these boards for NIH and NSF, and you're absolutely right. There's so many that never get funded, right? And what do you tell these folks? Like, okay, this is a great 
you know, it's a great proposal, change this, but changing that is not gonna necessarily make you get funded next year, you know? And so I think there is a question between that relationship between really politics and science or politics and academia, right? And like, what is our role in this moment? I could say one of the things that I've been really, really impressed by um, as I'm like moving into this like third project that I'm doing is the, is the, the eagerness and kind of um, uh, just enthusiasm of young scientists, like young neuroscientists that I'm engaged with who are not simply just asking questions about how do I build, you know, the better fMRI machine, but like how do I answer these questions about equity? Like what is my, what is my role, right? Not, and, and even my role when I'm just studying mice, what is my role to be, let's say, more socially just in like the world and what can I change in that type of way? And I think that is going back to, I think some kind of ethos that we may have had like in the 1960s and so, where we were in a particular type of turmoil and I think it was affecting um, the direction of students in a particular type of way, right? Wanting to answer these larger social questions. And so I feel like we're kind of coming back to that. And I, I'm, I'm actually open for that. I'm actually kind of happy to see that, that we're having more conversations about the things that are happening within society because they do affect, right? Exactly what Kevin said. They absolutely do affect like whether or not, you know, not simply whether or not we have funding, but like who gets care, right? Who, like we could ask the question, like with these new technologies, we are, you know, the brain initiative, have, we have billions of dollars into that, but the one simple question that we ask as ethicists is, who will actually get that care, right? Who will be available for to have gene editing, right? And who won't, right? Because it, it will likely fall in the same type of inequalities that we have. And I think there's a role that we can play as academics, right? As researchers of really pushing, not simply just ourselves, right? I think most of us really agree with these things already. And we're like in an echo chamber when we're talking to each other, but like really pushing that out and, and, and really having a more kind of political voice in that sense. Not politics with that like small P, but politics with that big P in that way. Mm. Fred, what's your answer to that question? I like that, Oliver. Yeah, so I think, um, I think studying neuroscience has definitely changed how I walk our dog. Um, and uh, you realize he lives in an olfactory world. You know, it's that cracker down the corner is, has been, been imprinted in his olfactory memory. And, and um, it's a different world than we live in. And, and that kind of comes back to this thing of the seamlessness of our perception of the world and, and how our sensory systems are, are guiding our world. Our sensory systems are interrogating the world and giving us information that's behaviorally useful for us. It's not the actual world that we, the true world that's out there. It's, it's the world that's useful for us to learn about. And, and I think that gives you kind of a different perspective on what the world is that, that you're living in. And, and um, that can probably be extended well beyond sensory systems to think about just your, you know, your nervous system is filtering all of this information that's coming in and telling you the pieces that it thinks you might want to know about and might be useful for your survival. You, you feel like that's the reality of the world you're living in, but it's not. And, and different animals, probably different people are experiencing really different worlds by virtue of those different filters that are applied to the, the signals that they're getting in. I think that that, for me, that's kind of an important way to look at, look at how the nervous system is working. Ananya, yeah. <laughs> you get the last word. Uh, so in my case, how did neuroscience change the way I look at the world? Okay. I tried to write a fantasy book. It was supposed to be high fantasy, lots of swords and magic and you know, Game of Thrones type of thing. I somehow managed to include a lot of logic in there. The main character had too much memory instead of you know, losing memory. And then the whole thing became about how it's happening. Is there magic or is there science or is there technology? Somehow I managed to make a fantasy book more about science than my PhD thesis. And <laughs> I still am not sure. I mean, the blurb says, memories of a life she never lived. What does that even mean? Makes no sense. <laughs> but I couldn't help it because this is what I have thought about my entire life. This is what I have studied for my entire adult life. And 
it's just such a part of me, the way I see the world, the way I feel like people are thinking. Even when I am trying to make a fantasy story, it somehow becomes neuroscience. And this is how neuroscience has changed my outlook that I feel, think, I, when I am angry, I actually feel my brain area is getting lighted up. And this is not normal, people. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is not. But this is how it affects you because it's not only the eight hours that you spend in the lab, it's what you think when you wake up. It's sometimes in the middle of the night you will have an idea and you need to write it down because you have to see whether it works next day. So this is how neuroscience has changed my outlook of the world. It has changed me. Mm. So I, I, I think <laughs> that's, that's the work. Could I just say, uh, before we transition to the break, uh, you know, you see the passion that, that comes through from our panel. Uh, I just want to, on behalf of the entire panel, thank the Great Matters group. You know, they have an immense passion. We've all touched it and felt it through the course of these last few weeks. And it's just a, a beautiful evening. So thank you folks very much for having us here. And thank all of you for coming. And we look forward to the Q&A.
All right, thank you everyone. Um, before we resume with the Q&A portion of our panel, um, we have a winner for the first raffle of the evening. Is Emma Coves here? No. How about Alexander Kalmada? <laughs> Marilyn Boyce? Trevor Michael. Yeah, awesome, all right. All right. Um, you can come collect your prize, awesome, right now. Sweet. Yay, thanks Trevor. <laughs> We'll now move on to our Q&A session where all of you get to have a conversation with our panelists. You can ask questions at the microphone at the left aisle. Everyone say hello to Maeve. Hi, Maeve. <laughs> and um, also via Slido online using that tiny.cc link, there will also be a slido.com code um, that will be that's right there. Um, Slido users can vote on submitted questions to ensure that the questions with the most interest rise to the top, um, and we'll alternate between in-person and online questions. Our panel is focused on the future of neuroscience, but also addresses diversity and ethics. Think about what curiosities you've brought with you tonight, and now is a great time to get those questions answered. If you are asking your questions in person, feel free to form a line down the aisle next to Maeve, and then she will hand you the microphone. The questioning has begun. Oh, we have, feel free, yeah, go ahead. Oh, wow, those are hard act to follow. Those are very good questions. Mm -hmm. I hope mine uh, is good too. So good evening, and I, I had a vertigo treatment this morning, and so I'm so shaky, I can't stand up. But I have waited for this evening. I've really wanted to be here and come up from Tumwater. So thank you all for what you do and Gray Matters for putting this on. My question is this, I, I currently am on this campaign to try to convince decision makers to incorporate a PK, that's um, uh, kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten through 12th grade neuroscience curriculum tweak. So they would add a neuroscience um, curriculum in all school districts in Washington. And so I looked out in the internet to see if I'm the only one who has this great idea, and thankfully not, because I don't have credentials. But I am working in my local communities and um, trying to convince them that this is a good idea to address some of these problems. So um, whether it be, um, violence, racism, if you lay that down from the beginning with children who just love to learn and they're pruning and they want to learn about everything and if you help them understand what the amygdala does and what the prefrontal cortex is at age appropriate lessons from little all the way up until their 12th graders I'm kind of wondering if we couldn't eradicate some of this trouble that we have in society because it gets worked out as they go along because they understand where it comes from. It doesn't come from just a bully or a parent with a problem. It comes from the brains of those people. And it's a bit of a buffer for a child. Then they don't absorb that. They don't say, 
what's wrong with me? And they grow up with this and maybe they decide to go into a school and take that out on everybody versus working it out amongst their peers and teachers to say, hey, what's your brain doing right now? Where's that coming from? Amygdala, yeah, it's the fear center. Why do we have a fear center? Why does it go a little awry? And we just talk about that from pre-school, kindergarten, all the way up through seniors. And maybe we have a different society by the time they graduate um, because we know why we really tick. There's no ambiguity anymore. There's no what's wrong with me and I'm gonna take it out on everybody or I'm gonna do too many drugs or eat too much or this or that. So thank you for listening. Um, out there, pounding the beat, trying to get decision, decision makers to make this a priority in our schools, a neuroscience tweak in our curriculums. Thank you. I, I, I'm happy to make a comment on that, and it ties back to the comment I made uh, in the last hour about brain health. I don't think anyone in this panel or in the neurosciences would say no to more neuroscience education. I remember in school we dissected cow's hearts. It was fascinating. I'd much rather dissect cow's brains. You know, I think, uh, I think there's an opportunity there. The thing about, uh, about a, a neuroscience curriculum is that at the very least it could embed uh, aspects of brain health. And I'll give you a good example. How many of you, when you were in, in, in school, learned about how absolutely critical sleep is? Okay, good. So it's a, it's a little more than I expected, actually. That, that was never a topic when I was in school. Sleep is absolutely essential for your healthy brain. And yet think about what our average sleep habits are like. They're terrible, right? When the computer's late at night, we wake up at odd hours. Um, some very basic aspects of our everyday life can be adjusted if people had a bit more information. I will say though, I think it is uh, uh, optimistic to think that that might lead to major societal change. And I, I'm sure that our, our colleagues up here would agree, but a, a basic understanding can only be a good thing for our, our, our population. I'll just say one other thing there too, that I think, um, one of, one of the things that we're really, with the, there's room for a lot of improvement and, and, and uh, you know, applaud you guys for your outreach efforts in this way, but is the difference between learning about science in the context of some questions that you answer at the end of a chapter in a book and, and learning about what it means to actually get in there and engage in science in a hands-on way and, and, and providing opportunities for kids at every you know, every age to see what it's really like to, to get in there. You know, so, so personally, I got interested in science by working in a machine shop. And it was building tools to do an experiment. And I was like, I can go make this thing and then we can do an experiment that we couldn't do yesterday. I thought that was just, that, that resonated with me. And, and so there are all these different paths that kids can take to get interested in science and showing them that, that they don't have to be good at answering the questions at the end of the book. They just need to find something that they, they are interested in and that you know, rocks their boat and, and, and go for that. And I think that as, as, you know, as a community, we can, we can work to try to provide more opportunities for kids to see all those different paths that they can get to. It, all right, it seems like we're ready for our first Slido question. Um, quite, a, quite a difficult question. How do you define consciousness? Oh, lovely. <laughs> Unfortunately, 21 people upvoted it, so we, we could get it down to 20, but not much more than that. Oh, somebody did, somebody did. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like we have some trendsetters. Um, never mind, sorry. Where can we read Dr. Dr. Chaudhary's book? <laughs> We're democratic, guys. <laughs> Uh, 
um, on Amazon, but you have to actually figure out my pseudonym because that's not what I am selling the book at. Mainly because if you Google my real name, you will have three pages of articles and my puny book will not show up. So if you find my pseudonym, then you find my book. <laughs> Quite the mystery. Are we ready for an audience question? Uh, hi, uh, I'm, I'm s interested in neuroscience. I sure hope that would be obvious. Uh, but I also am interested in things like AI and data. And one of the cool things that uh, you've, I've found and people telling me what they've actually found is when you have things like image selection, originally in, in the brain, the eye will learn lines and it'll learn gaps and it'll learn other things and that'll put it together. Uh, but you see the same thing in things like AI image recognition where you see a very, where you see a very similar pattern to the previous. And I was wondering if there are, if anyone can speak more on things like AI or any other convergent examples of, we thought, oh, this is really cool and we figured it out, but it was actually something that the brain did like millions of years ago and we're only putting together that sort of thing now. You're talking about a little bit of, about something related at the, at the break and I think I think one of the interesting, this, this touches a little bit on maybe the second question up there. Um, I think one of the interesting things in thinking about the difference between how AI solves, so AI and, and, and the, the place I'm most familiar with this is really in machine learning approaches to solve you know, complex tasks that our sensory systems solve. And, and the breakthroughs there are amazing. Um, you know, so things like object recognition, right? You take an, you take an arbitrary image and, and AI can say, okay, that's a banana and that's a boat and that's this. Um, and that's something that could not be done 10 years ago. Um, those breakthroughs, at least my understanding, have largely come from throwing computational power at the issue. Bigger training data sets and, just, and more free parameters in the models. Um, that didn't happen in our brain in the last 10 years, right? So we have a, you know, we have a relatively impoverished set of computational machinery to solve those problems. And so I think there's a real question here as to whether the AI approaches are gonna give us insight into how the brain solves those problems because they may be choosing approaches that are, are exploiting the, the complexity of the, the CNN networks that are being used, the number of free parameters and so on, and not um, tapping into efficient mechanisms for solving those problems that may be the real core of how our nervous system handles those. Um, and I think there are, in fact, there are cases where AI has sort of systematically moved away from network architectures that might resemble those that our nervous system uses to those that are more computationally efficient for solving the tasks that, 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 that are opposed to that network. So almost moved away from being able to really interpret how AI solves the problem in terms of how our nervous system might solve the same problem. So I think there are interesting connections there, but, but um, it, it's gonna be difficult to, to be able to make those connections in a really concrete way. I'd like to make a comment on, on, on the AI piece too, because I think this is such a fascinating and hot topic. And uh, in my opinion, the, the promise of AI cannot be overstated. Um, if you think about what, uh, how a brain learns, right, you have the, the construct, it gets presented with information, it manipulates that information and then produces something different. That's, that's, you know, that's how we think of intelligence, right? And the more uh, connections your brain has, the more it can learn, the more it can do. And that's happening at the speed of biology. So you have a, a neuron that depolarizes, releases vesicles, they, that diffuse across the synaptic cleft, they interact with receptors. All those things take time. Right? So what, what I'm seeing or what you're hearing actually happened a fraction of a second ago. It just took a little bit of time for your brain to process that. AI is working at the speed of electrons. 
right? And that is an order of magnitude faster than the speed of biology. And it is increasingly capable and increasingly complex and has access to information that we would never individually be able to access. Um, and so I, I think the promise is, is incredible. I think the danger is also something that we don't well understand. And that's why you know, we talked about the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach to these, these problems. And you've all heard the warnings from Google's uh, father of AI, I'm sure, that uh, these systems are getting smarter than people in many components, right? Um, but the, the things that it'll do to the neurosciences, oh, I can hardly wait. I think it's gonna unlock a whole lot of doors. Looks like we have Slido questions. Dr. Yu, most interesting or difficult surgical case? Yeah? <laughs> An easy question. But actually it's not. It's, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, you, it's, uh, it's not a good question when you ask somebody, you know, what's the, what's the longest home run you ever hit? Or, What's the fastest rate? I mean, there's no such thing. It's like, it's um, in the sense that uh, most interesting and difficult surgical case, they're all very difficult and they're all interesting and they're all not interesting because after a while you've, you've done so many of them, it's just, it's, just, it's just work, right? So let me try to answer that question in a different way where um, um, for me, the most difficult case um, <clears throat> is an aneurysm. Um, so if you guys know what an aneurysm is, it's a dilatation of a blood vessel, an artery, um, most commonly, um, where there's a weak spot and the blood keeps pounding on it and that wall of the artery sort of balloons out and expands. And if that happens in other parts of the body, um, you may bleed a lot and perhaps bleed out to, you know, and, and die from it, but in the brain, because it's, we have this big, we have this really hard skull, there's not much, there's really nowhere to go for the brain, the bleeding, except to cause a lot of pressure to build up in the brain, so it can cause a lot of damage. So when you have an artery of the brain rupture, um, that's a very difficult problem. A third of the people die on the spot, and a third of the people die in route in the hospital, and only a third of the patients survive. So it's a really bad problem that we get called upon as neurosurgeons and endovascular surgeons now to treat these conditions. Um, it used to be where the brain surgeons did all the treatment for aneurysms where we would actually go in there and it's like a, like a clothespin, it's a clip. And you obviously open the head, you, um, you dissect your way through the brain, um, you get to the aneurysm and you put a little clip around the neck of the aneurysm so that the bleeding stops, or ble it won't bleed again, and the, the, you're saving the patient, right? Um, but when you have a fresh aneurysm that's ruptured, the brain is very angry. There's been a lot of bleeding, there's a lot of pressure, increased pressure. So, and trying to find that little artery and that little aneurysm and put that little clip with the microscope with a high power magnification is, is technically very challenging. Um, and if you don't do a good job, then the bleeding will continue. By right, the way, we actually put clips on the parent vessel to stop the bleeding so you can see what you're doing. But if you put a clip on the parent vessel or the, the dominant vessel where the aneurysm moved from, you're, then you're gonna cause the patient to have a stroke if you don't hurry and get the aneurysm clip, right? So it's just a really tense case. Um, so when you are doing an aneurysm surgery and you're clipping the aneurysm, trying to keep it from bleeding again, it is probably, in me, in my mind, the most challenging neurosurgical case. Um, it has changed because we have now endovascular surgeons who now, through an endovascular, through the vessel route, are able to coil the aneurysms without having to open the brain and it's, it's, um, uh, it's something they do well enough that vast majority of aneurysms don't need to get clipped. But it is probably the most difficult surgery and I always bring an extra pair of underwear when I go into this case because it needs changing during the case. And I, patients, patients don't die in surgery these days. Surgeries don't lead to death because they've just gotten to be that good. But an aneurysm, ruptured aneurysm surgery is one of those in which 
I know that sometimes our, we will lose some patients and they will die either in the OR or soon thereafter because the, the case was so difficult. So I d that's a little view into my world. It's one of the most difficult cases. I, I hope that answers that question. Oh, wow, it's nerve wracking being up here now. Um, <laughs> so I want to ask the question to all panel speakers kind of as our understanding of neuroscience evolves and our applications of this understanding uh, continues to grow, what are some topics or applications that you feel we should be very cautious with or careful about proceeding with and how we apply those in the world and society as a whole? I do want to say if you're asking a question to all five panelists. All five panelists, please keep, try to keep your answers relatively brief. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of different answers to that. And it's a lot of, one is because neuroscience in itself, as we are saying, is, is huge. Like, I mean, what, you know, it can be t a bunch of different areas. Um, I can speak mostly to kind of the areas that I look at that, are, that is neuroscientists who study social behaviors. And I think there's a lot of areas there that raise a lot of different questions about whether or not we can study social behaviors. For me, there's, a, there's an interesting question around risk and prediction, right? And so one of the things I'm really thinking through is like, what does it mean for us to kind of predict, you know, a particular kind of social behavior in the future, right? And what's all the, kind, there's a lot of social conditionings that go into that, right? First, we're usually predicting someone who's really young, right? Um, we're only predicting risk, like what do we even mean by risk, right? So it raises all types of questions like that. The you know, researchers that I was studying who were who looking at violence, it raised a lot of different questions around can you predict one who is being violent? One of the, the critique that I put in my book, one of the problems with that science is that it can't actually deal with systemic inequalities. So within that equation that we're using within that brain model that we're talking about when we're saying we want to know whether or not someone has anti, will be, will grow up to have antisocial behavior. One of the things that neuroscientists told me that really does not fit into the model, or actually as they said, it's too complex to put in the model, is something like racism, right? Uh, which is a very systemic thing within our society, embedded within our society. But the question for me is if we can't use, if we can't think about embedded inequalities, like sexism or racism or any of these things which absolutely affect social behaviors, not simply the person who's behaving, but how us in society read that particular social behavior, then it raises a question of how, what is this model actually predicting, right? Like who can it actually, like who, who does it actually fit, right? And it raises a question of like whether or not it leads to inequalities instead of actually fixing some of those things within society, right? And, and that's, the, that's the tricky point, I think, for a, a bunch of this. Like, you know, how do we apply this outside within the larger social, you know, in the larger social world? Uh, one of the ways in which I think about this a lot is like the, the questions that we ask oftentimes will define the solutions that we're looking for. So if we're asking a question around the criminal justice system, which is already fraught with a lot of inequalities, the question raises like, what are we actually trying to fix? Are we trying to fix that system? Because that system is, is really messed up. Right, and it takes way more than just a brain-based model to fix that system, and so it raises a lot of different questions of what it can actually fix, or what, you know, what precisely does it address in that way. Sorry. I mean, I think, I think the, the, that's a great, that's a great direction. It's the one that comes to mind immediately. Um, just kind of the sociological implications of of um, of how you use information and whether you use it in a way that that. Um, it, it is really promoting disparities among people is, is, is really important. Um, I'll take it a different direction just to add to that. And I think, I think in the in the BMI, the brain machine interface field, I think, and this is going to be true of a lot of other areas, but but the brain machine interface is just an example of this. Is um, in science, there's a lot of pressure to say, I found a solution to this. Look how great my solution is. And I think when you're d at the patient interface, you have to be really careful about not promoting false hope, right? So not, we, we've got this really cool device that's gonna revolutionize how, how people who say have, um, you know, have lost a limb, how they're gonna be able to interact with the world. You have to really be careful about, 
that, how that's put out there. I have a controversial comment, which is that I don't think that, that um, we should be, I think we should build the brakes at the same time that we build the car, right? I think we often are trying to think about the brakes before we've built the car, and that can slow things down. Science will move forward. We, we need to put the guardrails in place, but we should not try and stop it because you know, AI, genetic change, those things are going to happen. It's a, a question of how we direct them. Thank you. All right. Our Slido question, what are the some of the most unexplainable phenomenons in neuroscience to this day? It's quite ironic that you're being asked to explain them. <laughs> uh, I, I think the answer is probably the other question, consciousness. Um, but since none of us want to speak on that question, I don't think. <laughs> Seems like we're good on that question. <laughs> Go ahead. I think I think one thing uh, uh, goes oh. maybe a little bit on the direction of consciousness, but I mean ultimately the brain is lipids and proteins and ions, right? How do those come together collectively to explain these like just highly complex behaviors that that? our brain is capable of and that our ca brain is capable of, of kind of directing us to. And I, I think that um, it's a little, there's another question up here that's kind of, is there something, is there something more to it than that? Is it, is it, you know, if you go to the biological hardware store and I give you a free pass to buy whatever you want at the biological hardware store, can you put all that together and, and, and make a brain that behaves the same way ours does if you really know the rules by which to put things together? Um, from a reductionist scientific point of view, the answer would be, yeah, if you understand how to put all those things together, you will, you, you will make a brain that will behave the way a normal brain works. But, but that, I mean, coming to that understanding, we're, we're just, we're so far from, from that right now. Um, uh, so I work in a fly lab and um, I was telling my PI that I was going to this event and he asked me to ask uh, about how we could be anti-racist in Drosophila research. Um, but I was wondering about how can we put, because we do basic research and a lot of talk about anti-racist uh, research is a lot of it's like applied or translational. Um, but basic research and research of animals, neuroethology, does not happen in a vacuum. So I was wondering how we could be anti-racist in our practices. So uh, let me try to repeat the question. You can tell me if I'm correct. The question was, work, you work in the fly lab, and the, the question was around how can folks who, I guess, work in non-human neuroscientists be anti-racist? Is that, was, that yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, so this is actually a question that I'm like thinking about a lot lately. I have a third project. I have two projects that I'm like working on. One is dealing with neuroscientists who study uh, implicit racial bias, and then the other one is thinking about the relationship between science and society, and particularly science and anti-racism. And so I do make this argument that there needs to be a way in which we can, that the burden should not be only on people who are studying, let's say, human organisms, right? Like, like it, you can't have anti-racism and it's only like the folks who are doing medicine or only like the folks who are dealing with human subjects. That's not what anti-racism means, right? Um, and so it raises some questions to me around, one, us defining what anti-racism is in the first place. I think traditionally what we've done is what I call, we've been using kind of a representation model for everything, and that's really through DEI. And to me, DEI, DEI and anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and anti-racism are not the same thing. DEI is something you need to get toward anti-racism, but it's actually the first step. We oftentimes, both in the academy and outside the academy, are using that as the final step. And we're assuming that as soon as we become diverse, all of these questions around racism will actually be answered. 
and really what it ends up being is that the burden on those marginalized folks to actually do the kind of anti-racism work actually increases along with the work that they already came to do, right? And so it's not necessarily anti-racist in that way. So one thing that I think about a lot, so I wrote a little piece on in, in science social behavior, I mean nature social behavior on thinking about like what does it mean to go towards an anti-racism? So one of the things that I say is that we're never, anti-racism is not a goal line. It's not like the finish line. There's no such thing as getting there and we can all be like, well, we're there, we're anti-racist now, right? It doesn't work like that, right? In fact, it's always a struggle and it's always gonna be a constant thing that we have to keep dealing with. The way I started to think about it though is like what, like, what do we need within society to make, to be anti-racist? Like, I ask this to my students all the time, right? I always ask them this question, is UW anti-racist, right? Raise your hand. No one raises their hand, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, how, or what would, what would UW look like if it was anti-racist, right? And so I raise the same question, like, what, what should neuroscience look like if it's going to be anti-racist? because that's the vision that we all need to be moving toward. First, agreeing on the particular type of vision, then moving toward that particular type of vision, which will require things that sometimes are, are not racial at all, right? Where they are racial, but not necessarily defined in racial terms. Like, who do we actually get our products from? Like, are we, or you know, like particular types of things to build, let's say, an FRI machine? Are the products of these things coming from countries that, you know, are poor? Are, there, are we dependent on particular types of like wage labor, you know, to, to, to do, actually do our science, right? Can we change that things up? Can we change the vendors that we deal with, right? It's a lot of different things, steps you can make that's not necessarily just like having more diversity within our labs, right? That leads us toward, really, because the question is not simply anti-racism, it's a more socially just society, right? And so there's a lot of different types of questions that go along in a more intersectional way that we could be thinking about that we can do in our labs, right? Even being more like visible, right? Answering questions about what does our science do? I mean, if you're gonna translate your science out as most basic researchers do, right? Thinking about what exactly would it look like once this gets translated out into human populations? What types of fraught questions could come up? What types of ways may I need to be able to talk about these things? Like all these ways I think move us toward like anti-racism in that way, yeah. Thank you. All right, um, a question from Stephanie. Can anyone speak to the gut-brain connection and what you see as the current state and future of healthcare in the root of neurological challenges via the gut? Well, I can say a little bit about that. So uh, the the gut-brain connection is at, at multiple levels. You might have heard of the microbiome, the idea that the organisms that are in your gut are producing chemicals, they enter your bloodstream, they influence other parts of the body, they influence your immune system, your neural state, a whole range of other functions. Uh, I think this question is actually a, um, uh, an example of the interconnectedness of everything within us. And one of the things that has become increasingly clear is that even diseases that we thought had relatively simple answers, you know, you find, um, uh, you find a genetic abnormality for say Huntington's disease, that's a classic genetic neurological condition. And you think, well now we know this answer, we should be able to fix it and we have genetic tools and so we have the means to fix it and actually you can't fix it, right? There's an incredible level of connectedness and, and complexity in our biological systems. What's happened now, though, is that we have the, the, the ability to see that more clearly. You know, I often say your, your brain is the most complex thing that we as a species know in the entire universe. There's nothing out there more complicated than the human brain. And so it takes a lot of time to figure things out. And we are at, at such an exciting place in the neurosciences because we have that ability more than we've ever had before. And the, the, the gut-brain connection is just one example of that. Um, there's a lot that's not understood, but just the fact that we now appreciate that there's a gut-brain connection is a massive step forward. So actually, I'm gonna give you a clinical um, application of this idea, is that I, I participate in um, a study uh, with a company that's putting in um, vagal nerve stimulators for uh, refractory depression. So patients who have severe depression that 
doctors doesn't respond to medications, um, they are finding out that if you stimulate the vagal nerve with an electronic generator, that you can actually get these people to feel better. And so we've been putting them in lately. Um, and I, we, I don't think we actually know why it works, but the vagal nerve is the connection from the brain. It's one of the cranial nerves that goes to the gut. So there's actually, from what I was told in, in doing this, that there's some research going on in Europe where by the simple use of yogurt, changing diets, changing your um, microbial environment in your gut, that, that depression is also being treated as well. So um, it is a clinical application that I certainly do in my practice by putting in these implants, but it is a connection between the brain and the gut that we're finding out that there's, there's a lot of interconnectivity as, as was being said. Um, hi, my name is Richard. I'm very excited to be here, not only as a member of Gray Matters Journal, thanks to all my friends who gave me this opportunity, but also as a curious learner to fulfill my uh, childhood curiosity. So I have a question. Uh, um, I've heard questions from other people that are wonderful. They talked about AI and most advanced stuff of our, of our brain. But I would like to discuss about some of the weak stuff of our brain. So I would like to ask a question from the perspective of evolutionary biology. So there are actually two parts of my question. The first part is I would like to know whether if like um, in a broader view is the human brain evolving faster or slower as we develop more technology and more interp interpretation towards it. And the second part of my question is, um, this is just imagine imagination to you all actually, to the, all the panelists. Um, I'd like to know if you are, let's say, God or the creator of humans, um, what is the next step that you might think human brain will evolve into? Like in which aspect will our brain continue to evolve? And also I'd like to know whether that day will come um, before the day that computers can like fu um, fundamentally analyze how our brain works. So this question is basically about which will go to evolution first? Is it the technology or the natural process? Thank you. That's a fascinating question. <laughs> so so um, the, the, the question of, uh, of human brain evolution, I mean, remember we got here over a million years of evolution, right? And I think we have to accept that there's a, a certain pace to human evolution. Some of the evolutionary pressures now are different, right? I mean, we're both wearing glasses. You go back 10,000 years, would we have survived? Could we have seen threats? Maybe not so much, right? And so there are different evolutionary pressures now than, than uh, we've had historically as a species. But I think we all, I, I shouldn't say that, I certainly believe that we're constantly evolving uh, as, a, as an organism. We're organisms like any other organism on this planet, right? So we're in constant evolution. It just happens at a snail's pace usually. And so to your question about whether the human brain will evolve or, or uh, computer systems, uh, electronic systems, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote the electronic systems part. Uh, I heard a line the other day, which you might have heard, that the AI that we have today that's the worst AI we're ever going to have, right? And it's so true. It's, it's getting better and better and faster and faster. And so I think that the rate of change there is exponentially more than what we're seeing with the human brain. Whether we'll become you know, dumber with all this tech, I think, uh, is an, an unknown. Um, are we, for example, less aware of directions because of Google Maps? I mean, I certainly am. I follow the blue arrow. I arrive at my destination. All's good, right? But if you said, are you going north or east? I literally have no idea. But do I need to know that? And is my brain less so because I don't know it? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. That's a great question. But this is what I was kind of going to add, that the more we are actually using technology, the <laughs> I don't want to say the less we are using our brain, but we don't memorize a lot of things anymore because we can just look them up. We don't have to remember even our loved one's birthday because we get reminders. Everything nowadays, yes, we might be engaging in, in a lot of higher level functions, definitely, but a general practice of memorizations that we used to do very easily, now it's getting difficult. And I don't know whether that's a 
positive direction that human brain is progressing or not. Exercise is necessary even for brain. So as the AI gets better, are we, dare I say, devolving? <laughs> That's the reason I don't write sci-fi. <laughs> I'm not sure of a, of a different mindset. I, I actually think that, um, and I don't, AI is the really probably the wrong word to use. It's just, it's just technology, it's just progress. I mean, you know, if you're talking about glasses, I mean, you guys have things now that I didn't have as, as, a, as a child. I mean, Pong was the greatest video game I've ever played when I was a kid, right? Right, so to me, um, is it evolution or is it adaptation? But it's just, we're just creating things as a society because we have this brain of ours that we can do so, and it just changes us. I don't know if we'll grow a third arm because we've evolved in the next 10 years, but what will happen is that we're just gonna do things differently. I mean, when the cars came around, people were like, I can't ever drive that, I have no idea how to operate that, but now soon we'll be f having flying cars, right? So. I think society will, we as, as, as organisms will change, evolve, adapt because of the assist, assistance of technology. That's the way I see it. And it's inevitable. It's, it's gonna come whether you like it or not, but it's also gonna do wonderful things for our society as well as do terrible things for our society. It's both. That's the way I see it. All right, um, we're gonna be taking our final question from Slido. Um, unfortunately, we can't entertain any more in-person questions. My apologies, we have limited time. Um, but if everyone who feels they can um, could answer this question, how much do we really know about how specific thoughts and motivations are manifested in the brain? Can we identify specific thoughts? Seems like we got an answer, guys. <laughs> so the, the answer is uh, not, not much. We know what certain areas do. So you, know, you, you heard the comments uh, from our neuroscience educator about the amygdala and the, the fear reaction or the fear centers. So we, we have an idea what certain areas of the brain do. And remember, the brain is incredibly organized. It's incredibly structured, incredibly organized. Um, how those pieces communicate and, and what connects with what, that, that remains relatively mysterious. And certainly specific thoughts are hard to follow. So you can do functional MRI and image brains that are working and say, well, you, know, you think about playing tennis, that's the part of the brain that lights up. And that's because your brain is, is coupled to metabolism. So the more I'm talking right now, for instance, the areas of my brain that deal with speech get extra blood flow because they're working. But to get down to the specific neuronal connection, what neuron fired to what neuron was blocked by what interneuron connected to what other neuron, we're not there yet, at least in people. We can do stuff like that in dishes in the lab, but not yet in people. It's coming, but it's not here yet. All right.